Good morning and good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. And this webinar series is uh, sponsored by both APRU and the Institute on Inequalities in Global Health. So let me go ahead um, and welcome our guest speaker for today. So Prof Professor Sophia Greskin is the director of the USC Institute on Inequalities in Global Health, Chief of Policy and Global Health D Division at USC. She's professor at the USC Keck School of Medicine and the USC Gould School of Law at USC. She's really recognized as a pioneer in fostering multidisciplinary approaches to global health. And her work ranges from global policy to the grassroots level um, and is particularly recognized for her efforts to bring attention to the effects of law and legal frameworks on health outcomes for key and vulnerable populations. So please join me in welcoming our speaker, Professor Greskin. Hi, thank you, Melissa, first of all, for the invitation. And to everybody online, good evening, uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, wh wherever it is that you are. Uh, it is a pleasure to do this, and I am really looking forward to this conversation. Um, I thought I would start by saying something about why I chose this quote unquote complicated title. Um, and it, it seems right now, with the pandemic affecting us all in all parts of the world, we're at a crossroads, not only for what the links are between global health, global governance, and human rights but actually what they can become. And I fear that at this moment, if, if we are not careful and vigilant, we may end up dismantling the structures and systems that support global health and human rights without replacing them with anything that's better. So that's the concern that took me to this title. And, and just to give you a sense of, of where we're going, um, what I'm, you know, when I'm sitting here listening to somebody talk, I want to know kind of what they're going to be talking about in brief. So here's my overview, just so that there aren't any real surprises. And I think the best way to move things forward is to begin by uh, defining my terms so it's clear what I mean by the words that I'm using as I use them. So first, in terms of global health, really, I'm talking about a focus on collective action here, um, but it really is about moving us past looking at health problems only in relationship to our own country or to our own experience. And I think each of the definitions I've put up here brings up important issues about where we are now and what is needed to address the virus. Really, it is about collective action and always with an eye towards trying to achieve health equity uh, everywhere in the world. For global governance, in general, it's about the range of actors responsible for addressing collectively challenges that transcend national boundaries. But importantly, the UN is the primary actor responsible for coordinating that collective action. And just to be particularly clear, when we think about the virus and its aftermath, they're responsible not only for coordinating peace and security, but unified standards for health, uh, and they're responsible for the promotion and protection of human rights. So what do I mean by human rights? Um, I mean what the UN means, that they are internationally agreed to, that they're about the relationship between the individual and the state, and that they really set out what the governments of the world can do to us, cannot do to us, and should do for us. And in terms of human rights law, it's about what governments have agreed with one another are their legal obligations to promote and protect our rights. And I can't stress this enough. I'm not sure if you all have seen this, but today Pompeo, who's the US Secretary of State, announced the results of a commission he put together, which attempts to redefine human rights according to US values. He calls it a commission on inalienable rights. And this nationalizing of an inherently universal concept like human rights is really dangerous. And I raise it here to be clear that when I talk about human rights, I mean human rights as agreed to by the governments of the world, not as conceptualized by any one government on their own. And by the way, that's a floor, not a ceiling about where we wanna go, but it's the best that we have and it's what it is that we should be working with together. <laughs> 
And these are the human rights treaties that exist. And the one thing I would ask all of you on Zoom is, do you know the human rights treaties that your government has agreed to be bound by? They're incredibly important for knowing what rights our governments have said they're legally responsible for enforcing, particularly in this very complicated time. And to be clear, every single country in the world, including mine, has ratified one, some, or all of these, which makes them a common standard across all countries. So what rights are we talking about? These are the rights contained in these international agreements that the governments of the world have agreed all have relevance for health and well-being. So what do you think? Do you see how these are relevant to the underlying determinants of health, to supporting people not to get sick? And once they are sick, if they do get sick, to getting the testing, care, and treatment that they need, and to supporting people on their road to recovery. Do you see how many of these are actually relevant to the current pandemic? And how many of these from your experience, your review of the literature, uh, what you read in the, in the media, do you think are being protected by all governments of the world in the context of the pandemic? Certainly it's not the case in my country, but I would ask you to think about all countries in this little kind of thought exercise. And so I want us to talk a little bit about the current moment and think about what is happening around the pandemic for individuals, for communities, for governments, and for the UN system in its role for coordinating our collective action in terms of both health and human rights. So starting first in terms of ourselves before talking about others, how are we all doing? Are we all doing well with physical distancing? We're all on Zoom, so in that way I suppose we're doing well. Uh, but seriously, real question, how are you doing with the pandemic? with physical distancing, with hand washing, with mask wearing, with sheltering in place, if you're still doing any of this in your country as we're meant to be doing here in Los Angeles. And with all of this, how is your mental health? And I, I, I don't think I'm going out on a limb by saying no matter how privileged we are, how lucky we are in terms of our material conditions that allow us to be part of even this Zoom call, we're all finding the current moment difficult and stressful, no? So look at uh, the WHO recommendations. And let's just talk about one of these for a minute. The idea, I think, behind each of these seems great in the abstract from a public health perspective. I mean, think of social distancing, which seems like a very good idea. But let's talk about this uh, in, in practice. Um, it seems good from a public health perspective to suggest physical distancing. And by the way, I'm gonna use the term physical distancing because I like it much better than social distancing. I, I hope that you agree. But you can imagine the health officials making this decision because of their perception of what is needed to maintain the health of the community in the context of the virus. You can totally imagine the conversation, less to restrict the number of people who can travel at any one time to keep people safe. Till you think about what's happening here. And it makes it clear that this is much more complicated than simply thinking about health directives on their own in a vacuum without attention to the larger economic, social, cultural, and political context in, in which these regulations happen. And then let's think about enacting physical distancing regulations more generally that tell people they have to remain two meters or six feet apart. What does that mean if you live here? How in the world do you actually make this happen? And, and to take this now a bit further, remember how I asked if each of us how we're doing right now, how we're living with shelter in place directives, whether from our local, provincial, state, or national governments. These are happening in real time for many people around the world. And the directive is often don't leave your house for weeks at a time. But let's talk about what that means. And I have a number of what ifs on this slide, but can you imagine if you're not able to stock up on food? or if you live with an abusive partner, across the world there are reports of violence in the home that are skyrocketing. Or, or you need to get to the pharmacy to get medications because they're not available in large enough prescriptions. W what do you do then? So let's talk a bit about what is the government's responsibility here? The government who puts the shelter in place order, what do they need to be considering before issuing these sorts of directives, which we all know are necessary from a public health perspective? But then for them to actually work, don't you need access to water and sanitation facilities, to food, to medicine, to an alternative source of income if you can't go to work, a certain level of space uh, around you, and that you're going to be safe? 
uh, in terms of your general health and well-being, but also more generally from violence in your home, but also in your community if you do need to go outside. But what sort of resources are needed for this to happen? And for all people, no matter how poor or vulnerable, um, is it feasible? How much of this goes beyond the purview of a Ministry of Health? Don't you see that like, a, addressing the virus is not just a health sector issue. So let's start with the virus in the current moment. What's actually happening? What are national level responses? And let's start with what a Ministry of Health would consider relevant. So in any of our countries, how well is this being done? And I realize, again, that my country probably has the worst record in this respect, but I consider these to be areas of concern everywhere. Are all people getting the same accessing to testing across the board? Certainly we know there are huge discrepancies in access to testing, to PPE, to ventilators, to access to needed medicines. But the reason I'm raising this here is that in all cases, what's needed from the government's perspective to make any of this happen, purely at the level of making this happen, there needs to be the science and the evidence behind the decision. The decision needs to be written out in some form by some body. The regulation has to be passed by the same body or, or a different body with the authority to do so. Resources have to be allocated. Um, those responsible for implementing it have to be trained. The directive has to be known to the general public. There's a lot of steps here. So what does it mean to actually implement each of these and to do it well. And thinking about the fact that normally it takes time to put all of that in place, but in the current moment, things are happening very, very quickly because the pandemic is real and there's a real urgency. And yet that's only part really of what's being done across the world at the government level to address the virus. What does it mean to impose these? What does it mean to implement them? What part of government is responsible? Is it the health department? Is it the police? Is it the military? And again, I'm starting from the perspective that the governments are trying to do the right thing in an impossible situation. But let's talk about the way some of these are perhaps even with the best of intentions playing out in practice. And other than my own country, I'm not planning to name specific countries, but the truth is you can easily find this information online if you're curious. So, in one country, 1.3 billion people were mandated not to leave their homes for any reason for three weeks. In another, more than 25,000 people have already been detained for not complying with the quarantine order in place. Across the globe, literally tens, and I think closer to hundreds of thousands of people have been detained for non-compliance with these orders. In several countries, we know that thousands of people have been beaten by the police for non-compliance with these orders, but then immediately let go because they didn't have the facilities to hold them. In one part of the world, a man was found beaten to death hours after he was arrested by police officers for not wearing a face mask in public. And on the other side of the world, a woman in a public place was beaten to death by police officers, again, for not wearing a face mask in public. A huge number of countries have also passed emergency laws that punish people for potential or perceived COVID-19 exposure, as opposed to actual exposure. And they can be prosecuted for an offense, including assault, attempted murder, or murder. There are literally, again, hundreds of people around the globe who have already been charged with this offense. And just the penalties that are written in in terms of these laws are intense. As an example, in one country, the law says anyone to be found outside breaching the COVID-19 lockdown can face 21 years in prison. And in several countries, again, spanning different regions of the world, healthcare workers who speak out about the virus and in particular, the inability of their health system to handle the number of cases coming up, whether to the press or on social media, are being arrested, they're being charged and detained for quote unquote spreading false news or uh, terrorism. And then let's talk about contact tracing using phone apps for a moment. This has been introduced into law as part of the coronavirus response in a lot of places. But the question is, should this be permanent? While contact tracing is a vital part of controlling COVID, at COVID, 
was it, what does it mean that these data are being collected? What might happen with the data gathered? Who does it go to? What does it mean for monitoring people's movements and contacts over and above the specificities of COVID? If cooperating with contact tracers might mean getting surveilled by the police, in the US, a recent study just showed that people won't cooperate, even as it's happening here anyway. And on a more basic level, what about an app that worked for monitoring and contact tracing during the virus? Should it be taken off of people's phones when the virus is under control in the long term? Is it okay for that app to be used by the government to track people's personal health status, lifestyle choices in the name of public health, or just more generally once the virus is no longer a threat? Who should have access to this information, but who should decide? And I, I do also need to say that the virus has allowed politics to be played out in some rather complicated ways. For example, in the shutting down of health services, even if they're provided for in law just because they are claimed to be not essential. So as one example, in Texas and Ohio, in, in my country, they have shut down all surgical abortion services on the grounds that they are not immediately medically necessary. The Texas decision was made because, quote, stopping abortions will help free up the demand for personal protective equipment like gloves, masks, and gowns. Now, Planned Parenthood has filed a lawsuit in Texas, but these are the sorts of things that are happening the world over. Now, I literally have hundreds of examples I've been collecting from across the globe for these last few months. And I, my point isn't to get exhaustive about the list of examples, but I want you to ask you to think in each case, how is this put into law? How is it financed? Who is trained to and responsible for enforcing it? What are its human rights impacts? And most importantly, Given that the rationale for these measures is addressing the virus, how effective is it in public health terms? You have to think also, why or why not criminalize failure to follow public health directives? And why or why not to criminalize actual coronavirus transmission? What's good or bad in each of these cases isn't just from a human rights perspective, but really from a public health perspective. And just to be clear here, from a human rights perspective, um, there is a global standard that can help in assessing these sorts of measures to see if they're appropriate, because it is legitimate in human rights terms to restrict rights for the sake of public health. So interfering with freedom of movement when instituting quarantine or isolation for COVID uh, on a limited basis is an example of a restriction on rights that could well be necessary for the public good and legitimate in public health terms under international human rights law. And on the other hand, something which would be of obvious concern are the more random measures that are being taken by authorities which restrict rights in the name of COVID are not based on public health evidence, are more arbitrary or discriminatory in who they target or how they are applied. So most the interference with most rights can be legitimately justified as necessary for public health, but it can only be a last resort and all of these criteria need to be met. That said, within government, this is always a balance and different parts of government may have very different criteria for deciding that a restriction on rights is legitimate or that it is a violation. And making these decisions is not easy. It requires dialogue. Look at this case from Ohio with two different parts of government, which I think in some way speaks for itself. And if testing positive for COVID puts people at risk of being criminalized, again, many won't get tested. But just to give you another example that would also illustrate this point, the government in another country is putting into law the need to make public the names of all the people infected with the coronavirus because the, can, the pandemic is contagious and notifiable. But the country's COVID-19 regulations under the Public Health Act make it criminal to disclose anyone's coronavirus status. So there's a conflict there. There are two laws saying opposite things in one country. So again, the question becomes who decides and according to what criteria. So just to close this section on what governments are doing, the virus is a public health issue. Does that mean it should be regulated by health law? Should it be regulated by criminal law, by police, by the emergency powers? Who's responsible for enforcing the law with what training and with what resources 
and support. And I'm not suggesting that anyone is correct in all circumstances. You have to look in each case, but we do need to be aware of these points. And ultimately, I believe we should be judging these measures by whether they are effective according to whether they're having their desired public health effect. So let's say something now about global standards. So given that global governance is about collective um, action based on unified standards for health and protection of rights, what are they saying about if human rights need to be considered in making decisions in the context of corona? So let me start with the international health regulations, which should ultimately govern our response to the pandemic, promulgated by the World Health Organization in order to prevent, protect against, control, and provide a public health response. And it's a good idea in practice, and, and note here the attention to, to human rights. And on the positive, it demonstrates the potential value of the UN and multilateralism to address pandemics. But on the negative, with all of this, as the UN is made up of its member states, it only works to the extent that states comply. So like with all of this, it's only as strong or as weak as the extent to which states take it seriously. And while clearly the UN felt that from a rights perspective, uh, let alone for the rest of what's here, this was not sufficient. So let me go and take you now to March of 2020. Uh, the first director from the UN about COVID and rights. Note that it came from UNAIDS, responsible for the UN response to HIV. And basically what this says is that 40 years of responding to the HIV epidemic has generated significant experience on the importance of human rights to ensure effective and proportionate responses to epidemics. And key is the need to have a community-centered and informed response that prioritizes the most vulnerable and that empowers people to be able to take action to protect themselves and others from the virus. And that ultimately these are essential for creating trust between affected communities and the government. Seems wise, right? Um, it's a question as to whether how many governments heeded this advice to begin with in terms of the responses that they made. We then have this statement from the World Health Organization. And, and why does this matter? It's important because as it's the WHO, it shows that it's important for public health. It's paying attention to human rights, not because it's nice or it's the moral thing to do, but because it will improve health outcomes. And just to say here, that despite the ridiculous attempt by President Trump to pull out of the organization, they are the global organization responsible for health and well being, for ensuring coordinated responses. And yes, they have made some mistakes, absolutely. But ultimately, they are and they should be trusted. And this statement by them is important for what a COVID response could be. And I, I just want to take you to this statement from the UN Secretary General which is after the countries of the world started putting into place the sorts of laws I was talking about earlier, Gutierrez said the pandemic is a public health emergency and it's a human crisis fast becoming a human rights crisis. And he specifically grounded that in the rise of ethno-nationalism, populism, authoritarianism, and the pushback against human rights. And the fact that the crisis is providing a pretext to adopt repressive measures for purposes that are unrelated to the pandemic. Now, I, I wish I could have left it there because it's a strong statement. Um, but uh, then the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights came out with a directive on, let's be clear, pretty much every link to COVID you can possibly imagine in its engagement with human rights. They're all extremely valid, of course, but eventually, I mean, even for me, it's a bit much that it's all there, which is why I was grateful uh, for this piece from Lisa Reisenberg uh, that I put in the readings, which basically shows that between February and May, the UN put out more than 150 statements on COVID and rights. Crazy, right? Uh, and for those of you that know this holiday song, The 12 Days of Christmas, I thought she had a good sense of humor in terms of how she laid everything out. But that said, I want to be clear, I don't think it's all blah, blah. Right? I think it's super important to have the UN and all that can do clarify the links between COVID and human rights, but also call out governments when their COVID related actions don't comply with public health and human rights norms. So for example, on June 30th, 
um, so just a, a week and a half, two weeks ago, the UN human rights chief, Michelle Bachelet, called out countries directly and said COVID-19 was being instrumentalized to silent free speech. And she voiced alarm at statements by the US government that were denying the reality of the virus. She pointed to, and I will name the countries here, Russia, China, Kosovo, and Nicaragua, among others, were threats and intimidations against journalists and bloggers and civic activists, particularly at the local level, were being used with the apparent aim of discouraging criticism of the authorities. She voiced concerns about severe restrictions on freedom of expression in Egypt uh, and excessive and arbitrary enforcement of pandemic response measures in El Salvador. Uh, she said it was vital for leaders to maintain consistent, credible, and fact-based communication with citizens and praise South Korea for their open approach, in contrast to Belarus, Brazil, Burundi, Nicaragua, Tanzania, and the United States, which were cited as raising real concerns because of their government's legal and political responses. So let me begin to wrap this up. I think it's undeniable that the promotion and protection of human rights matter for the COVID response. There's a legacy here, and it's important we build on that legacy and that we don't abandon it. As we move forward, we need to think about the questions paying attention to human rights can offer us. What ultimately can paying attention to human rights offer as we think about COVID and its legacy on our lives and, and our institutions, both within our countries and globally? How do we get here and, and how can we come out of this crisis in a way that can reduce rather than foster inequality? And, and how do we make sure that our responses to the pandemic um, and any in the future seek to optimize both public health and human rights because it's the right thing to do, but also because it's the most effective. It's a lesson we learned from HIV and one we shouldn't have to keep relearning whenever there is a new global health crisis. So what will it take us to get there? Uh, a couple of things I want to leave you with in closing. These new harmful COVID laws will need to be challenged. Some of this is starting to happen, but this will need to be a focus in the next few years. We need to be documenting the harmful effects of bad laws and the positive outcomes of good laws in the context of COVID, and then doing all of the work necessary, which will include training. I don't mean of the police and the military for how to better implement the laws that are on the books, but of lawyers and judges on the science, on the evidence, and on the lived experience to give them the information necessary to move these judgments out and repeal these bad laws. Many of you on the Zoom call are public health researchers. I ask you to help us all to gain a better understanding of the relationship between national emergency legislation and their specific impacts on people's health in the context of COVID. Did these policy measures help or did they hinder the response and others more generally? COVID has raised awareness of inequalities in global health that were always there, but they've made them much clearer and that seems to be a really good thing. Um, but it's also made clear that public health, especially on a global scale, is rarely separable from politics and we have to be vigilant about this. We also need to watch the ways in which the meaning of national security is being recast. What does it mean for health and security be, to become so intertwined? Is it okay that the virus has allowed the architecture of surveillance and social control to expand in the name of public health? Is that something we feel good about or not? It's something we need to determine. And we need to recognize that health as a right moves us away from simplistic solutions towards addressing the larger underlying determinants of health that have always been there. Not because of just it's the right thing to do, but because it's effective. And I want to end with two pieces of very recent good news, because COVID is a reminder not only of the global connectedness of the pandemic, but its collective solutions. The WHO Director General announced last week, by the way, the same week that Trump formally announced his plan for the US to pull out of WHO, the initiation of the Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response to evaluate the world's response to COVID. And it's co-chaired by two amazing women, former Prime Minister of New Zealand, Helen Clark, and former President of Liberia, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, both incredibly independent thinkers and both with a commitment to multilateralism, but willing to ask hard questions. And the second is the call for the people's vaccine. 
Under international human rights law, the obligations undertaken by states extend beyond their borders. And basically that the, the obligations one has beyond one borders are not subsidiary to, but equal to the obligations one has within one's own country. More than 140 world leaders and experts, including the current and former presidents and prime ministers of Brazil, Canada, Chile, Ecuador, Ghana, Ireland, Korea, Latvia, Malawi, the Netherlands, Pakistan, Portugal, South Africa, Senegal, Sri Lanka, the UK, and New Zealand signed an open letter calling on all governments to unite behind a people's vaccine against COVID. I think the letter marks an incredibly ambitious position set out by world leaders, demanding that all vaccines, treatments, and tests be patent-free, mass-produced, distributed fairly, and made available to all people in all countries, free of charge. Both examples show not only the potential value of global solidarity, but highlight, I think, in different ways, the need for the very structures and systems that support global health and human rights, and that my government and others are right now trying to dismantle. I hope you agree with me that we cannot let that happen. And in the words of the WHO, now moving forward, that we're all going to work to ensure the health and well-being of all people everywhere in the world and without distinction. Thank you.